Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 1 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Kamran and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. No glittery critique here, just love, baby. Hear, hear. <laughs> we'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and it's not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we would really like to hear from you and we really mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you've got to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. We have a correction to make today. During Memories of Ice prologue, we mentioned that we thought that the mention of the Cripple God was the first mention of the Crippled God in the Malazan books, and that is incorrect. Okay. Jax PK2669 reached out to us, thank you Jax, and reminded me that the first mention of the Crippled God is actually in Gardens of the Moon when Kruppa was in Mammoth's study and he was reading Aladart's Realm Compendium researching the mention of the five black dragons by call when he was drunk oh okay the calling down and the chaining of the crippled god is mentioned there not a lot of detail about why just that it happened and who was there okay thanks jack yes thank you jacks we really appreciate that all right chapter one part two his single functioning eye blinked open to a pale blue cloudless sky the scar tissue covering what was left of his other eye tingled with a maddening itch he was wearing a helm, the visor raised. Beneath him, hard, sharp rocks dug into his flesh. He lay unmoving, trying to remember what had happened. The vision of a dark tear opening before him. He'd plunged into it, was flung into it. A horse vanishing beneath him, the thrum of his bowstring. A sense of unease, which he'd shared with his companion. A friend who rode at his side, Captain Perrin. Talk the younger groaned. Yes. He lives! Yes. He's always been a good character. Yeah, and, and I always just wonder, because we're left so cruelly hanging <laughs> for a whole book and a half. Or is it book and two-thirds? Yeah, effectively. It's like, what happened to this poor fella? Dude, so welcome back, Talk. <laughs> yeah. It's been a while since you've been forcefully evicted from the Malazan universe, as far as I'm concerned. It's been over a year. In a... <laughs> <laughs> for us? For us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He thought, Hairlock, that mad puppet. We were ambushed. And the mention of Hairlock, that's somebody I haven't had to think about for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And he's a nasty little bugger, and I haven't had to think of clicky feet in a long time as well. Wonderful. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> his memory returned with a surge of fear. He rolled onto his side, every muscle protesting. He thought, Hood's breath, this isn't the Reavy plane. A field of broken black glass stretched away on all sides. Gray dust hung in motionless clouds and arms span above it. Off to his left, perhaps 200 paces away, a low mound rose to break the flat monotony of the landscape. His throat felt raw. His eyes stung. The sun was blistering overhead. Coughing, Talk sat up. He saw his recurved horn bow lying beside him and reached for it. The quiver had been strapped onto the saddle of his horse. Wherever he'd gone, his faithful Wiccan mount had not followed. No! It was a Wiccan <laughs> horse. Yes. That's a heavy loss. It is. They're equal to like five or six regular horses. <laughs> I could believe that. Yeah. We got a couple. The, the Grawl Gelding. Yeah. And then the stallion that Kalam picked up <laughs> yeah. was quite a trooper as well. Those are some really magnificent steeds. Face Biter in particular, the Grawl <laughs> Gelding, is just legendary just because of the fact that it just... Man, it just bit that fella at, at the perceived <laughs> at the perceived <laughs> insult. I'm just like, wow, what would happen if you really insulted it, dude? It's like, golly, it's I would. <laughs> Do you think anybody's done any fan art of that scene? Oh my word, I'm sure. I'm sure most of this has been mapped out by fans somewhere here and there. I'll have to do some research on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> have some merch with a horse biting some dude's face face biter like you some other comic book yes it, we can put that up there with the snake pliskin 2024 shirt you know it's like that's uh we can put face biter 2024 
<laughs> Chrome gelding. You know, it's yeah. like a small yeah. print or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Apart from the knife at his hip and the momentarily useless bow in his hand, then, he possessed nothing. No water, no food. A closer examination of his bow deepened his scowl. The gut string had stretched. Anytime mention of gut string takes me back to that <laughs> episode of Hannibal. I know exactly. Yes, I know exactly where you're going. I can. <laughs> the string maker. Oh my! I can God. always just see that neck, that cello that neck, deeply inserted. impacted me. <laughs> that's a very horrific murder set piece of. A, that's one of the most grisly things I've ever seen. Has been from that television show. That's it, it's far outdone. It's some of the most sadistic horror movies I've ever seen in some of the murder set pieces in that show. I don't know how they got away with a lot of it on TV. I don't either. It's very, very, very hardcore. Yeah. And it still holds up, dude. And me and KP have watched that kind of recently. I mean, since we've been married. So, I mean, it, it, so in the past two years, it does hold up good. Some mm-hmm. of it gets a little weird, of course, but it is always weird. It's, you know, like it's a little highbrow. What do you want? Mm-hmm. It's a little hoity-toity here and there, but dude, it's fantastic. In regards to the gut string stretching, he thought badly, meaning I've been away for some time. Away. Where? Herlock had thrown him into a warren. Somehow time had been lost within it. He was not overly thirsty, nor particularly hungry. I wonder how the time works in the warren of chaos, because in the quote-unquote real world, we know it's been a little over two months since he disappeared. Right. This makes it sound like he was unconscious the entire time he was in the Warren. I assume that time isn't stopped there, but maybe it's a lot slower in relation to reality. Yes, uh, that's what I'm going to assume, too, is time flows. But I have another question. We're about to cover this. I'll come back to that. Okay, hold that thought. Okay. Even if he had arrows, the bow's pull was gone. Worse, the string had dried, the wax absorbing obsidian dust. It wouldn't survive retightening. That suggested days, if not weeks, had passed though his body told him otherwise. He climbed to his feet. The chain armor beneath his tunic protested the movement, shedding glittering dust. He thought, am I within a warren, or has it spat me back out? Either way, he needed to find an end to this lifeless plane of volcanic glass, assuming one existed. He began walking towards the mound. Though it wasn't especially high, he would take any vantage point that was available. As he approached, he saw others like it beyond, regularly spaced and thought, barrows, great. I just <laughs> love barrows. He saw a central one larger than the rest. Talk skirted the first mound, noting in passing that it had been holed, likely by looters. After a moment, he paused, turned, and walked closer. He squatted beside the excavated shaft, peering down into the slanting tunnel. As far as he could see, over a man's height in depth, the mantle of obsidian continued down. For the mounds to have showed at all, they must have been huge, more like domes than beehive tombs. He muttered, whatever, I don't like it. He paused, considering, running through his mind the events that had led him to this unfortunate situation. The deathly rain of moon spawn seemed to mark some kind of beginning. Fire and pain, the death of an eye, the kiss that left a savagely disfiguring scar on what had been a young, reputedly handsome face. A ride north onto the plain to retrieve adjunct Lorne, a skirmish with Ilgris Bargast. Back in Pale, still more trouble. Lorne had drawn his reins, reviving his old role as a claw courier. He thought, courier, let's speak plain talk, especially to yourself. You were a spy, but you had been turned. You were a scout in one arm's host. That and nothing more, until the adjunct showed up. There'd been trouble in Pale, Tattersail, then Captain Perrin. Flight and pursuit. He muttered, what a mess. He certainly got embroiled in quite the fiasco. Really bad luck on his part. And imagine all that stuff happened to him in such a short time. Yeah. You know, a, a yeah. relatively short time in his life was just like, you know, loss of the eye from that raining of rock down on him, peeled up and then into escorting Perrin, getting into that fight with the puppet, amongst other things, and, the, and some other stuff. With the, and then all of a sudden, just whoops, all that stuff at the, remember all that fun stuff at the dinner with the one arm? Mm-hmm. Where he's repping the claw, dude. He's, he proved himself a real thinker. That's where I really kind of started, really, I, I, I've always liked him. He's just such a likable fella. He's real, he's kind of a sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. a weird way, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, huh, he's oddly kind for Claw, but I will have an answer to that here, too. <laughs> Hairlock's ambush had swatted him like a fly into some kind of malign warren. He thought, where I lingered, I think, 
Hood take me. Time's come to start thinking like a soldier again. Get your bearings. Do nothing precipitous. Think about survival here in this strange, unwelcome place. He resumed his trek to the central barrow. Though gently sloped, it was at least thrice the height of a man. His cough worsened as he scrambled up its side. The effort was rewarded. On the summit, he found himself standing at the hub of a ring of lesser tombs. Directly ahead, 300 paces beyond the ring's edge, yet almost invisible through the haze, rose the bony shoulders of gray-cloaked hills. Closer and to his left were the ruins of a stone tower. The sky behind it glowed a sickly red color. Ah, we know exactly where he's ended up. Yeah, when previously, about time flowing differently, was he just thrown through a warren what i'm saying like when the hairlock opened that warren for him did he just like go from there to there and then passing from there to there it was just that length of time but he says it here that where i lingered i think i want so, you to think back to the prologue and the wolf oh that's true thank you yeah so he was there okay also if that wolf was there for a hundred thousand years or more mm -hmm. and time is diluted i don't know if the time experience to the people in that warren is also slower maybe it just seems like normal if you're conscious but right. maybe it just operates at a different scale is that wolf responsible for him being out i suspect so but i don't think no, we really, really have any confirmation other okay. than whatever happened in the prologue copy that okay cool very good talk glanced up at the sun when he'd awoken it had been a little more than three quarters of the wheel now it stood directly above him he was able to orientate himself the hill lay to the northwest, the tower a few points north of due west. His gaze was pulled back to the reddish welt in the sky beyond the tower. It pulsed as regular as a heart. He scratched at the scar tissue covering his left eye socket, winced at the answering bloom of colors flooding his mind. He thought, that's sorcery over there. Gods, I'm acquiring a deep hatred of sorcery. A moment later, more immediate details drew his attention. The north slope of the central barrow was marred by a deep pit its edges ragged and glistening. A tumble of cut stone, still showing the stains of red paint, crowded the base. The crater, he slowly realized, was not the work of looters. Whatever had made it had pushed up from the tomb, violently. Uh-oh, the thing in the tomb made its way out at some point. Do you think the Talani mass came back to deal with it like they planned to? I'm guessing that's probably the case. Maybe came to at least check it out and see what's going on. Get a report. Really? You think so? Maybe, uh, maybe not. You can never, I, I don't know what's going on here. I wonder if the memory lasts that long. <laughs> yeah, we'll deal with it. I'm curious. <laughs> the honey-do list. <laughs> I think we'll have an answer to your memory question too. Yes, I think the memory is fine. <laughs> oh yeah, good point. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah. Talk thought, in this place, it seems that even the dead do not sleep eternal. He shrugged off the nervousness he felt and thought, you've known worse, soldier. Remember that Talan Imas who joined up with the adjunct. Laconic desiccation on two legs, Beru fend us all, hooded eye sockets with not a glimmer or gleam of mercy. That thing had spitted a bargas like a Reavy Plains boar. That's one of your favorite moments from Gardens of the Moon, <laughs> if I remember correctly. You are correct, sir. <laughs> it's pretty much our intro to Tool, so yeah. Him grabbing that guy's ankle and then the yeah, sword. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, so God, so... that's just tough. That's rough. Good yes. Gracious. <laughs> locked into places this thing is coming up right between you like that it's just like oh my gosh this is not going to go good this is not going to go good <laughs> it's almost like something out of a zombie horror flick where they're oh. the evil dead or something where they're coming out of the ground it's worse because yeah it's sentient evil dead <laughs> mm. i mean it's not like mindless chaos it's like weapon wielding evil dead yeah when we travel mm. on the dust and the wind <laughs> yeah Eyes still studying the crater in the mound's flank, his thoughts remained on Lorne and her undead companion. They'd sought to free such a restless creature, to loose a wild, vicious power upon the land. He wondered if they'd succeeded. The prisoner of the tomb he now stood upon had faced a dreadful task. Without question, wards, solid walls, and arm span after arm span of compacted, crushed glass. He thought, well, given the alternatives, I imagine I would have been as desperate and as determined. How long did it take? How malignly twisted the mind once freed? He shivered, the motion triggering another harsh cough. <clears throat> <laughs> nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's funny timing. He skirted the pit on his descent and made his way toward the ruined tower. It was unlikely that the occupant of the tomb would have lingered long in the area. 
He thought, I would have wanted to get as far away from here and as fast as was humanly possible. There was no telling how much time had passed since the creature's escape, but Tox's gut told him it was years, if not decades. He felt strangely unafraid in any case, despite the inhospitable surroundings and all the secrets beneath the land's ravaged surface. Whatever threat this place had held seemed to be long gone. Forty paces from the tower, he almost stumbled over a corpse. A fine layer of dust had thoroughly disguised his presence, and that dust, now disturbed by Tox's efforts to step clear, rose in a cloud. Cursing, Tox spat grit from his mouth. Through the swirling, glittering haze, he saw that the bones belonged to a human. Granted, a squat, heavy boned one. Sinews had. I'm just, every time I see the word sinew, I think <laughs> sinew like that barbecue guy. <laughs> Oh, sinews had dried nut brown. And the... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> now it's in the back. Oh my gosh, I've incepted myself. Sinews had dried nut brown. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm back. I, the, the, the incepted yourself got me. That wasn't the sinews. Oh my good gracious, I'm sorry. <laughs> sinews upon sinews. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm good now. Go okay, bring I don't go believe ahead. you. Okay, go ahead. I'm covering my mouth. But the problem is, I'm smiling. I'm on the edge. Right so you're now. waiting for me to bust out. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, I'm shaking. It's it off. not I'm your good. fault. I'm just fragile right now. It's okay. Sinews had dried nut brown, and the furs and skins partially clothing it had rotted to mere strips. A bone helm sat on the corpse's head, fashioned from the frontal strap of a horned beast. One horn had snapped off some time in the distant past. A dust-sheathed two-handed sword lay nearby. Talk thought, speaking of Hood's skull, he scowled down at the figure and demanded, What are you doing here? The Talani mass said, Waiting. Talk searched his memory for the name of this undead warrior. He said, Onos Tulan, of the Tarad clan. Tool said, I am now named Tool, clanless, free. And he's back too. Yes. And that's part of the fun of these books. When we get to jump around, go to Seven Cities, now come back to Genabacus. I enjoy having these little reunions when the characters have been separated for a while. It feels good to have them back. Agreed. And for some reason, this is always an interesting. Their banter coming up here and whatnot as we later on go through this book is very intriguing. And yeah, you know, I'm like you in the fact that this happens several times with these little reunions, not just with them, but with other characters we're going to meet back up with. Mm -hmm. It's always real fun to get back to those people. Talk thought free? Free to do precisely what, you sack of bones? Lie around in wastelands? <laughs> he asked, what's happened to the adjunct? Where are we? Tool said, lost. Talk asked, which question is that an answer to, Tool? Tool said, both. <laughs> this is the definition of laconic speech. It's funny because he just used that description of him a couple paragraphs yeah. ago. I love it. Oh, it's too funny, man. Talk gritted his teeth, resisting the temptation to kick Tool. He asked, can you be more specific? Tool said, perhaps. <laughs> Talk said, well. Tool said, adjunct Lorn died in Darujistan two months ago. We are in the ancient place called Morn, 200 leagues to the south. It is just past midday. That's relatively close in a way to Darujistan. I forget that Morn is that close. Yeah, about 600 miles. Yeah, I think that's about right. Or is it more like nine? No, it's six. I think it's six. I think it was three miles to a league. Yes, I think it's uh, that's what I'm thinking. It's like three, so yeah. it's about six hundred miles. I mean, that's not close, close, but at the same time, it's not terribly far either. I mean, it's not starting at the minimum two thousand miles away. It's like it's like no, this is not just terribly far from Darujistan. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Talk said just past midday. You said, "Thank you for the enlightenment." He found little pleasure in conversing with a creature that had existed for hundreds of thousands of years, and that discomfort unleashed his sarcasm, a precarious presumption indeed. He thought, get back to seriousness, idiot. That flint sword ain't just for show. He asked, did you two free the Jagut tyrant? Tool said, briefly, imperial efforts to conquer Darujistan failed. Scowling, Tok crossed his arms and said, you said you were waiting. Waiting for what? Tool said, she has been away for some time. Now she returns. Talk asked, who? Tool said, she who has taken occupation of the tower, soldier. Talk asked, can you at least stand up when you're talking to me? He then thought, before I give in to temptation. Tool rose with an array of creaking complaints, dust cascading from his broad, bestial form. Something glittered for the briefest of moments in the depths of his eye sockets as he stared at Talk. Then Tool turned and retrieved the flint sword. Talk thought, gods, 
Better, I'd insisted he just stay lying down. Parched leather skin, taut muscle, and heavy bone, all moving about like something alive. Oh, how the emperor loved them. An army he never had to feed. He never had to transport. An army that could go anywhere and do damn near anything. And no desertions, except for the one standing in front of me right now. I forget that he was laying down for that first part of that conversation. I don't know why I find that deeply amusing now. It's just like, oh my good gracious. That's, that's <laughs> really, it's like, oh, good gracious. That's hilarious. <laughs> he never even bothered to get up. He's just he even, laying there face down. I, face down, face up, something. I'm not sure. It's not even looking. Just like, but what? It's just like that got that Eeyore, yes. Whatever. <laughs> perhaps. That does paint that in a different light. Yeah, I, I'm so, I, kind of, I completely forgot that. It's like, oh my good gracious. That's too funny. Talk thought, how do you punish a Talan I'm ass deserter anyway? They stared at each other for a long moment, then Talk said, I need water and food, and I need to find some arrows and bowstring. He unstrapped his helmet and pulled it clear. The leather cap beneath it was soaked through with sweat. He asked, Can we wait in the tower? This heat is baking my brain. Talk thought, and why am I talking as if I expect you to help me, Tool? Tool said, The coast lies a thousand paces to the southwest. Food is available there and a certain seagrass that will suffice as bowstring until some gut can be found. I do not, alas, smell fresh water. Perhaps the tower's occupant will be generous, though she is less likely to be so if she arrives to find you within it. Arrows can be made. There is a salt marsh nearby, where we can find bone reed. Snares for coast birds will offer us fletching. Arrowheads. Tool turned to survey the obsidian plain, then said, I foresee no shortage of raw material. Talk thought, all right, so help me you will. Thank Hood for that. He said, well, I hope you can still chip stone and weave seagrass, Talan I mass, not to mention work bone reed, whatever that is, into true shafts, because I certainly don't know how. When I need arrows, I requisition them, and when they arrive, they're iron-headed and straight as a plumb line. Tool said, I have not lost the skills, soldier. And I find that interesting, to remember those skills for hundreds of thousands of years. I don't recall if I've seen any Talan I mass using ranged weapons. Maybe they threw a spear or something, but most of them seem to be using melee weapons. I wouldn't think they've used these skills in some time. Yeah, and I agree with that to the extent that they wouldn't have been using them because, you know, that a lot of times in my brain ties to a race in particular. That's that's how they would survive is by hunting. And since eating no longer seems to be on these guys' list of things they need to do, yeah, you think it'd be something lost, but apparently they have no problem recalling things. Which is weird. I wonder where the memories are stored. Their brain's gone. Well, part of it seemed to be... Uh... I think since we've gone through it, I, I'm almost under the impression that there might be almost some sort of, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's like a cloud back up. Because it seems to be that tool seems to be intact. Kind of. I mean, yeah, he's, he's, I'm sure his sense of humor is just dried up over the millennia. The ritual itself and keeping them alive keep them intact to some extent. I'm guessing it does. Mm. You really caught me off guard with the spiritual cloud backup <laughs> thing. Well, I don't have any other way to say it. It's. I think it's a beautiful way of describing it. <laughs> and me being a nerd, love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's very, it's very apropos. It's like, yeah. They revert to the light into the last save before the before the vow. You know what? So Talon is their cloud services provider. Yes. Hopefully they don't have any crowd strike issues. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. Can you imagine these guys showing up in some tech uniform? <laughs> uh, I'm here to serve you, I, but I can't even do it dry enough. And it just has to be just like, hello, I'm here to serve you. It's just oh, like, you know, man. it's just like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Would people get more or less upset if someone was deadpan and assisting them with tech support? I would be appreciative. That's you. You're correct. We were in customer service. <laughs> we are different. We are way different. Than I had to people. assume the persona of someone that cared. <laughs> <laughs> Failed at that. Turned into a robot. <laughs> oh, oh, my word. I love that statement. You had to assume the role of someone who cared. That's brilliant, <laughs> sir. That, <laughs> that was not uh, a, a good role for me. No. Customer service. I am, of course, bred for customer service because I do love people. But it's like I love people in short bursts, in customer service bursts. You know, it's great. 
you ain't got to deal with them. You're not taking them home with you. There's too much Walter Sobchak in me with <laughs> people not wanting to follow the rules. I, I, I the do. rules I, are there and nobody wants to follow the rules. <laughs> that was the brilliance of fries for me was because I got to talk about the rules, but not care because it's like all I had to do was go, MIC, please. Uh, Man, like, manager in charge. <laughs> <laughs> like oh my gosh my life was so simple because it's like, mic please it's like okay hold on one second yeah <laughs> as soon as i internalize the fact that if the company doesn't care about their own rules i shouldn't care about their rules exactly and then it wasn't a problem anymore exactly see this is why i am like the worst nightmare in my current position because i've learned how to to, to just navigate the ways of being left alone completely by the people who employ me <laughs> because I do very well at my job. I work very hard and there's like, you know, th there's certain metrics they want you to get, but you, you can't really do anything to make you get. And so when they get to talking to me about it, I keep throwing their own words back at them <laughs> and mm -hmm. they don't really like that. And I, mm. I get that. I get that. It's like, we live in a day and age where that is the rule of law. Where you, it doesn't matter if you don't like it. I mean, you told me this. It's like here's here, here, here it is. What is it? Is it like um, how many tchotchkes you have to have on, or <laughs> what is this? What? what <laughs> how many pieces of flair? Oh my good gracious! You got me bad with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a certain amount of things that we're supposed to. You know, there's things we ask. You know, the, you know, you know the rules at, at fries. Are you going to put that on your fries card? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. but the big, the big thing that they really like that our store really is. My people are obsessed with is getting people's email. Oh yeah, you gotta get. And people hate giving you email. I hate giving you my email. I'm not giving you my email. I'm not right. asking you to give me your email because I can read the room. I've been working customer service for almost forty years, so I know who's not going to give it to me, and I know who is going to give it to me. Now I can work hard and I can push hard and push through it but i don't care there's certain things i just don't care about because i don't care i care about the customers i honestly do care about my customers and customer service has become so backwards to the extent that my customers apologize to me for there being lines i'm like my job's waiting on y'all it's like why are you apologizing about making a line i don't care they're gonna wait y'all gonna wait so they, they know i'm aware of them they're gonna wait i'm here for i'm here to wait on you mm. they're here to have me wait on them the same way because people love that People still respond to that in this day and age when people think customer service doesn't matter. It still matters. So I'm sorry. I'll stop. <laughs> Come to Belk. <laughs> no, no. Where customer service still matters. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know what's funny is I'm so nice to people now when I go to places because I know what it's like to be on the other end of it. Oh, yeah. I think everyone should do that just to so they would be a little more hum humble when dealing with people. But I've always had the ability to surf that part where people can people can start getting kind of ugly to me. And part of me just I have an ability at some point, at some point, to disconnect. Now you know, you know, I do have limits. Now I've gotten older, and there's parts where I just don't put up with. But I, I I've not had any issue but one with a customer. And it wasn't even it was just a woman that perceived me as being rude because I told her that I couldn't wait on her because she was coming from behind the counter. Mm -hmm. You know, we have like a behind the counter where I put stuff and that's that I work with kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And and she's kind of a heavy set lady, older woman, and she you don't have to be so rude. I was like, I'm sorry if you thought I was being rude. I never owned the being rude. I'm like, I'm sorry if you thought I was rude. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being rude. I, I, I was I was that way with her because I could get away with it because I could tell. Uh, basically, it's like, look, I'm not I'm not being rude to you. I'm being very nice. I'm telling you it's a safety issue. Well, and then the next question was like, well, where's your name tag? I said, I've been asking for my name tag, but my name's Billy. I didn't ask your name. I asked if you had to wear an name tag i said i said if you if you get on them enough maybe they'll get me one mm -hmm. <laughs> what's my response to her and it's kind of like okay okay she was back and forth with this nice and then being snide like that so it's different in a small town because these are older and i'm not trying to be ugly but i was like i'm not going to take you being cruddy to me i don't have to take you being cruddy to me this is we live in that day and age if you come and be nice i'm going to be super nice to you i'm going to go out of my way to be nice to you all right just be careful how you approach me <laughs> just do just the return result. billy <laughs> just do the return <laughs> okay sorry all right Flashbacks. moving along Flashbacks. moving along sorry we talked about <laughs> talk said since the adjunct never properly introduced us i am named talk the younger and i am not a soldier but a scout tool said you were in the employ of the claw 
Talk said, with none of the assassin training, nor the majory, besides which I have more or less renounced that role. All I seek to do now is to return to one arm's host. Talk about throwing someone to the wolves. No training, but attached to the claw. Sounds terrible. And especially throwing into a group that, like the bridge burners, who do not like claw. Yes, liable to get a knife across the throat. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, but who, who assigned him this role? I don't know that we ever saw who actually gave him the assignment. I'm going to have to assume it's Lacine, though, right? He's too young, right? Is, is it talk? Is talk like, are we ever, I know he's talked the younger, so I know I may be making an assumption, but I'm kind of assuming he's what, 20s? I always pictured him around the same age as Perrin. I, exactly. That's kind of what my impression was too, something like that, give or take a few years. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not far. I mean, so, okay, so young man. Yes. So most assuredly than the Empress, because I mean, these guys would have been teenagers when she assumed the throne. Yes. Or it happened under the Empress, I'll just put it like that. Tool noted, a long journey, and this in reference to Talk wanting to get back to One Arm's host. Talk said, so I gathered. The sooner I start, the better then. Tell me, how far does this glass wasteland stretch? Tool said, seven leagues. Beyond it, you will find the Lamatath Plain. When you have reached it, set a course north by northeast. Talk asked, where will that take me? Darujistan? Has Dujek besieged the city? Tool said, no. Then he swung his head around and said, she comes. Talk followed Tool's gaze. Three figures had appeared from the south, approaching the edge of the ring of barrows. Of the three, only one in the middle walked upright. She was tall, slim, wearing a flowing white talaba, such as were worn by highborn women of seven cities. Her black hair was long and straight. Flanking her were two dogs, the one on her left as big as a hill pony, shaggy, wolf-like, the other short-haired, dun-colored, and heavily muscled. Since Tool and Tox stood in the open, it was impossible that they had not been seen. Yet the three displayed no perturbation or change of pace as they strode nearer. At a dozen paces, the wolfish dog loped forward, tail wagging as it came up to the Talani mass. Musing on the scene, Tox scratched his jaw. He asked, an old friend, Tool, or does the beast want you to toss it one of your bones? <laughs> Tool regarded him in silence. Talk shrugged and said, humor, or poor imitation. I didn't think Talani Mask could take offense. He thought, or rather, I'm hoping that's the case. God's my big mouth. Tool said, I was considering. This beast is an A, and thus has little interest in bones. A prefer flesh, still warm if possible. Talk grunted, I see. After a moment, Tool said, humor. <laughs> wow <laughs> talk said right he thought oh maybe this won't be so bad after all surprises never cease tool reached out to rest the tips of his bony fingers on the a's broad head the animal went perfectly still he said an old friend yes we adopted such animals into our tribes it was that or see them starve we were you see responsible for that starvation Talk asked, responsible? As in overhunting? I'd have thought your kind was one with nature. All those spirits, all those rituals of propitiation. Tool interrupted. Talk the younger. Do you mock me or your own ignorance? Not even the lichen of the tundra is at peace. All is struggle. All is war for dominance. Those who lose, vanish. Talk said, and we're no different, you're saying. Tool said, we are a soldier. We possess the privilege of choice, the gift of foresight. Though often we come too late in acknowledging those responsibilities. His head tilted as he studied the A before him, and, it seemed, his own skeletal hand where it rested upon the beast's head. Upon arriving, the woman said, Bail Jag awaits your command, dear undead warrior. How sweet. Gareth, go join your brother in greeting our desiccated guest. She met Tox's gaze and smiled. She said, Gareth, of course, might decide your companion's worth burying. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Tox said, momentarily. You speak Daru, yet wear the Talaba of Seven Cities. Her brows arched. She said, do I? Oh, such confusion. Mind you, sir, you speak Daru, yet you are from that repressed woman's empire. What was her name again? Talk said, Empress Lacine, the Malazan Empire. He thought, and how did you know that? I'm not in uniform. She smiled and said, indeed. I wonder what she means by saying Lacine is repressed. How? I have no earthly idea. Maybe she's wound up real tight. She could be. <laughs> Seems to be pretty intent on taking over the world. I guess that maybe, but I, I could see her thinking that maybe the Lacine had a, a repressive regime that might be, but I don't even get that impression. She's very, it's her regime is hungry for more expansion, but I'm not sure what's spurring that. Is it, does it re the, the starvation for resources or, you know, I think she's smart. We know that Lacine's smart. We've learned that. 
<laughs> yeah. as of dead ass skates we've learned how smart lacine actually is right talk said i am talk the younger and the talani mass is named tool the woman said how apt my it is hot out here don't you think let us retire within the jagoot tower gareth cease sniffing the talani mass and awaken the servants what kind of dog does gareth look like to you i don't know because i'm not that familiar with dogs i pretty much know the kind of goldens i know the pits kind of style and also like uh the mastiff style which are the very 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 big dogs which is kind of what i'm guessing the impression of the baljack is more like <laughs> the giant small sized horse sized dog i don't know well bail jag is a wolf so i always pictured just a huge wolf okay very like a primal wolf the old school giant bigger <laughs> yes but you don't have an image of roughly what gareth looks like to you at all no maybe i've always liked uh, dobermans so a, a well-behaved dog to me would be like a good doberman okay to me it's always looked like a boar boil which is a south african dog that's bred to defend farms against lions lions get out of here <laughs> it's a mix of a bulldog and a mastiff that's where they originated okay. from so it's a they're yeah. beefy beefy dogs well i told you about the mastiff thing with my dad and how big my dad is those mm -hmm. things are big dogs i mean they're big dogs they're built like shetland ponies <laughs> but i will say this picture of this burble here he's a magnificent looking fella as long as i'm on the sweet side of him <laughs> yeah if you think pit bulls are nasty, the bite force on these things is, oh, I think it's triple the bite here. force of a pit bull. Yes, <laughs> they're crazy. Golly. That's not very cool. It is cool. They do a lot of damage. Uh, oh, my word. Good gracious. I got that bite right through bone real easy. Uh huh. Human bones. Yeah, yeah all bones. <laughs> Just all bones. bones. Yeah, bones. Just bones. <laughs> yeah. Rhino bones. I mean, this guy's yeah. as big as a lion. If he's just like a mastiff, I mean, that's the ultimate cat. That's the ultimate cat dog fight. Oh, yeah, probably. I still think the cat would win in the long term. I think the cat would leave because it wouldn't want the hassle of this thing barking at it and trying to get a hold of it. Probably. I don't know. I'm curious. Talk watched the burly dog trot toward the tower. The entrance he now saw was, in fact, via a balcony, probably the first floor. Yet another indication of the depth of the crushed glass. He said, that place doesn't appear very habitable. The woman murmured, appearances deceive, and once again flashed him a heart-stuttering smile. As they walked, Talk asked, have you a name? Tool said, she is Lady Envy, daughter of Draconis, he who forged the sword Dragnapur and was slain by its present wielder, Anamander Rake, Lord of Moonspawn, with that selfsame sword. Draconis had two daughters, it is believed, whom he named Envy and Spite. Talk muttered, hood's breath, you can't be serious. <laughs> <laughs> Tool continued, the names no doubt amused him as well. I wonder why you would name your children this. I, you know, for a minute, I was wondering if it was assumed, but it's not assumed. He, it's Well, it said it's believed that, that he named them. But are, are these women, uh, Envy and Spite, are they ascendants? But I'm assuming, uh, if not ascendants, they're at least powerful due to their parentage. Good gracious. I have to think they have the power of elder gods. Yeah, but I'm assuming they're like immortals too, right? Like real immortals? I'm not sure. To what extent their powers actually are yeah we can't really say much right now anyway no no not anything i assume almost if not as powerful as their father yeah that's kind of my assumption too <laughs> and i forget so yeah we, we were finally introduced to draconis in this uh, prologue too think about icarium and gothos yeah. icarium is immensely powerful yeah and it's i'm assuming he's immensely powerful is it due to the fact that he just Okay, strangely enough, Deadhouse did a beautiful job of making a, a, some weird tie-in I had never think thought about till now. Remember the wizard in the nascent that followed them at first that had the that was the Warren using him, like just burning yes. through him, the lightning storm uh, guy. Yes, so Ikarium is like that, but imagine the next. It's like next level. I'm assuming because he can hold that power, he can channel it, he can contain it. Yeah. So that's, um, I guess, that's why he is so stinking powerful is because he can contain the, it's like channeling the atom bomb, but having direct access to it and being able to contain it. <laughs> right. Almost. So, but, but he's weird because he's damaged, but yeah, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm guessing you're right because the, he's most assuredly Gothos. All we know about him is he's a Jagoot. They're bad enough as it is. And we know that Draconis is an elder God. <laughs> are they, mm -hmm. are they equal? I don't know why I'm always wanted to lean that the elders are probably more powerful, but I'm not, I don't know why. I don't know why I think that some of the stuff that we've seen them do, like taking an entire continent and turning it into a Warren, you sure. don't see 
jiggy <laughs> doing stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Sure, they can raise some ice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, sure. that's understating oh, a little bit. Sure. An entire <laughs> continent of ice. Yeah, it's a little ice, you know. <laughs> it, well, to them, it kind of is a little ice. But, you know, but man, yeah, this is, that's kind of next level, I guess, storing that away someplace. Kind of, you know, here. I'm just going to put that here. Yeah. Lady Envy sighed, really? Now you've gone and ruined all my fun. Have we met before? Tool said, no, nonetheless, you are known to me. Lady Envy said, so it seems. It was, I admit, over modest of me to assume that I would not be recognized. After all, I've crossed paths with the Talani mass more than once. At least twice, that is. Tool regarded her, then said, knowing who you are does not answer the mystery of your present residency here in Morn. Should you look to pursue coyness, lady, I would know what you seek in this place. She mockingly asked, whatever do you mean? Last week, we were discussing characters that have been known to have been role-played by Mr. Erickson or Mr. Esselmont. Okay. Lady Envy was one character that I forgot to mention. Esselmont played oh. her as a non-player character. Okay, that's pretty cool. I thought, maybe I'll just list out the characters that they role-played. And that list is exceedingly long after I researched it and full of spoilers so okay, i wouldn't okay. advise if you're a first time reader going through the books looking it up to see who played what maybe when you're done definitely yeah but it is interesting reading through seeing which characters were played by whom actually some of the characters that are introduced are played by some of their other friends i am curious do you think that some of that stuff from their friends playing these characters some of those traits that they may have introduced crept in here what do we need to ask that question as they approached the tower's entrance, a leather-armored masked figure appeared in the gaping doorway. Tox stopped in his tracks and exclaimed, That's a Segula! He spun to Lady Envy and said, Your servant's a Segula! I am barely able to contain my excitement <laughs> with the introduction of this culture. One of my favorite parts of this book is learning about the Segula. I agree. Uh, great. He's, man, I forget. Just This is chapter one. Good gracious. What a great... <laughs> Yeah, I mentioned last crazy. week, it's like the amount of stuff that's introduced in this first chapter is crazy. <laughs> it's like, wow, I forgot we had to basically learn. All this is one thing I like when you do some of this back and forth. You have to kind of reintroduce yourself to this world and actually introduce yourself to a whole bunch of new characters. Yeah. Here we go. I love it. That used to kind of intimidate when you, if you look at his books and you like, what, Dramatis Persona, and you start looking through it like, good golly that's a bunch of folks to remember you ain't got to remember nothing don't worry about it you'll meet them and the, the, some of them are only in there for like one line sometimes i don't know why they put them in there so part of me is just like i always embrace that i love meeting the people in his world love them some of them are most of them are great too most of them are very memorable some people do have trouble keeping them all straight sure to be I fair do. i do I, I, that's I get their names mixed up a lot like uh, the ones that always mess me up are Ralik nam and malik rel because they're sure. kind of similar phonetically just a couple yes. things reverse that always messes me up i got you her brow wrinkled she asked is that what they're called a familiar name though its context escapes me oh well i've gleaned their personal names but little else they happened by and chanced to see me this one who is called senu and two others they concluded that killing me would break the monotony of their journey she sighed then continued alas now they serve me she addressed the segula senu have your brothers fully awakened the short lithe man tilted his head his dark eyes flat within the slits of his ornate mask lady envy said to talk i've gathered that gesture indicates acquiescence they are not a loquacious lot i have found <laughs> Tox shook his head, his eyes on the twin broadsword slung under Senu's arms. He asked, is he the only one of the three to acknowledge you directly, lady? She said, now that you mention it, is that significant? Tox said, means he's the bottom rung in the hierarchy. The other two are above conversing with non-Segula. Lady Envy said, how presumptuous of them! Tox grinned and said, I've never seen one before, but I've heard plenty. Their homeland is an island south of here, and they're said to be a private lot disinclined to travel, but they are known as far north as Nathalog. He thought, and Hood take me, aren't they known? Lady Envy said, hmm, I did sense a certain arrogance that has proved entertaining. Lead us within, dear Senu. The Segula made no move. His eyes had found Tool and now held steady on the Talan I mask. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Hackles so rising. I love all this crap. This is dude. so hilarious, dude. <laughs> oh my good gracious. Hackles rising, the A stepped to one side to clear a space between the two <laughs> figures. Lady Envy politely said, Senu? Talk whispered, I think he's challenging Tool. Lady Envy said, ridiculous, why would he do that? Talk said, for the Segula, rank is everything. 
If the hierarchy is in doubt, challenge it. They don't waste time. Lady Envy scowled at Senu and said, behave yourself, young man, then waved him into the room beyond. Senu seemed to flinch at the gesture. I wonder what she did to them that makes them flinch. The daughter of an elder god must have some significant power to leverage. <laughs> well, she did say they thought it would be entertaining to kill her. So she must have had a good time checking their privilege on that one. <laughs> and uh, they now make them flinch. I'm like, that gum. Uh, it's like, that's uh, that's pretty funny. And it's like, how that is, I mean, he's ready to square off right here. And she just like shoes him off into the other room. And he kind of like, he literally flinches like a dog who's been spanked a couple times. Like, mm -hmm. oh, 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 and he knows she'll back it up. Apparently, apparently she'll back it up. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is, but she does something. An itch spasmed across Talk's scar. He scratched it vigorously, breathing a soft curse. The Segula backed into the small room, then hesitated a moment before turning and leading the others to the doorway opposite. A curved hallway brought them to a central chamber in which a tightly wound staircase rose from the center. The walls were unadorned, roughly pitted pumice. Three limestone sarcophagi crowded the far end of the room, their lids leaning in a neatly arranged row against the wall behind them. The dog Lady Envy had sent ahead sat nearby. Just within the entrance was a round wooden table crowded with fresh fruit, meats, cheese, and bread, as well as a beaded clay jug and a collection of cups. Senu's two companions stood motionless over the table, as if standing guard and fully prepared to give their lives in its defense. Both were a match to their companions' height and build, and similarly armed. The difference between each was evident only in their masks. Where Senu's enameled face covering was crowded with dark stained patterns, such decoration diminished successively in the other two examples. One was only slightly less marked than Senu's, but the third mask bore not but twin slashes, one on each gleaming white cheek. The eyes that stared out from the slits of this mask were like chips of obsidian. The twin scarred Segula stiffened upon seeing the Talani mass, took one step forward. Lady Envy hissed, Oh, really? Challenges are forbidden. Any more of this nonsense and I shall lose my temper. All three Segula flinched back a step. <laughs> wow. Lady Envy said, There, that's much better. <laughs> she swung to talk and said, Assuage your needs, young man. The jug contains Saltoan white wine, suitably chilled. Talk found himself unable to look away from the Segula wearing the twin scarred mask. Lady Envy quietly said, if a fixed stare represents a challenge, I suggest for the sake of peace, not to mention your life, that you refrain from your present engagement, Talk the Younger. He grunted in sudden alarm, tore his gaze from the man. He said, good point, lady. It's only that I've never heard of. Well, never mind. Doesn't matter. He approached the table, reached for the jug. Movement exploded behind him, followed by the sound of a body skidding across the room, striking the wall with a sickly thud. Talk spun round to see Tool, sword upraised, facing the two remaining Segula. Senu lay crumpled ten paces away, either unconscious or dead. His two swords were both halfway out of their sheaths. Standing beside Tool, the A-named Beljag was staring at the body, tail wagging. <laughs> I love this scene. The mm -hmm. fact that we don't get to see any of it described makes it even better. <laughs> The A sitting there with the wagging tail is just the cherry on top. <laughs> it is. The only thing that would make it better if it was licking that dude's face, it was <laughs> mask even, something, I don't know, but that is just, uh, that's a core memory for me there. Just uh -huh. that, that break out of like, that scuffle that we don't see. <laughs> it's like you got two cats and you hear some craziness <laughs> going on and then you, you go, hey, and you go over there and you look and they're just sitting there looking at you like nothing's going on. <laughs> And you can detect nothing either. That's the worst. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I heard something go crash, and yet I can't see anything. What's, what's the matter here? Lady Envy regarded the other Segula with eyes of ice. She said, given that my commands have proven insufficient, I now leave future encounters in the Talani Mess's obviously capable hands. She swung to Tool and asked, is Senu dead? Tool said, no. I use the flat of my blade, lady. Having no desire to slay one of your servants. <laughs> Lady Envy said, considerate of you, given the circumstances. Tot closed one shaky hand on the jug's handle. He asked, shall I pour one for you as well, Lady Envy? I think if Tool had not used the flat of his blade, that fellow would have been lying in more than one piece. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wonder what parts would be cut off. Oh, my word. It might go all the way through the middle, because, I mean, those things are nasty. Mm -hmm. I think those are like armor piercing. <laughs> it's like they're like nasty. They're endowed with something. Mm -hmm. Imbued. Yeah, they're nasty. They're vor are they vorpal? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I, I think so. I think anything they touch is vorpal. They're bad dudes. Uh-huh. 
Definitely sorcerously invested. And especially with Mr. X first sword. I don't know. Is he still first sword? I think so. I think he's still first sword. Mm-hmm. I don't think I heard anyone call him out. <laughs> well, they're calling him out right now. They're calling <laughs> him out now. <laughs> If they knew he was the first sword, would that make it worse? Probably, yeah. Yeah, especially with a double shot there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're number one, get out of town, dude. You are the next on my list. Because you know that's exactly <laughs> what that dude's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Envy glanced at Talk, raised one eyebrow, then smiled. She said, a splendid idea, Talk the Younger. Clearly, it falls to you and me to establish civility. Tool asked Lady Envy, what have you learned of the rent? Cup in hand, she faced him and said, Ah, you cut to the quick in all matters, I see. It has been bridged by a mortal soul, as I am sure you are aware. The focus of my studies, however, has been on the identity of the warren itself. It is unlike any other. The portal seems almost mechanical. Talk thought rent? That would be the red welt in the air. Tool asked, You have examined the Kachain Shamal tombs, lady? She wrinkled her nose and said briefly, They are all empty and have been for some time, decades. Tool's head tilted with a soft creak. Only decades? Lady Envy said, unpleasant detail indeed. I believe the matron experienced considerable difficulty in extricating herself, then spent still further time in recovering from her ordeal before releasing her children. She and her brood made further efforts in the buried city to the northwest, though incomplete, as if the results proved unsatisfactory. Then they appeared to have departed the area entirely. She paused and added, it may be relevant that the matron was the original soul sealing the rent. Another hapless creature resides there now, we must presume. Tool nodded. A Kachain Chamal matron has been unleashed on the world. One that spent an unknown amount of time in considerable pain. This does not bode well. Yeah, this could prove quite troublesome, especially since we haven't been told a whole lot about these fellas. This is the first book where we really get to meet them, Kachain Chamal, isn't it? Yes, they've been mentioned a couple times. Yeah. We really don't know anything about them. Mentioned in both books, mentioned in Gardens and Dead House Gates. Uh, several times. It's not like a dozen times, but it's mentioned more than four or five times, I believe. And, and so it's it's not, it's a considerable name drop. Right. Their elder race, what yeah. they look like, we don't know. Elderly. How they lived, we don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, we're about to find out somewhere here. During the exchange, Talk had been busy eating and was on his second cup of the crisp cold wine. Trying to make sense of the conversation thus far was giving him a headache. He'd mull on it later. He said, I need to head north. Is there any chance, lady, that you can furnish me with suitable supplies? I would be in your debt. His words trailed away at seeing the avid flash in her eyes. She said, careful what you offer, young man. Talk said, no offense, but why do you call me young man? You look not a day over 25. Lady Envy said, how flattering. Thus, despite Tool's success in identifying me, and I admit that I find the depth of his knowledge most disconcerting, the names the Talani Mass revealed meant little to you. Talk shrugged and said, Anamander Rake I've heard, of course. I didn't know he took a sword from someone else, nor when that event occurred. It strikes me, however, that you may well be justified in feeling some animosity towards him, since he killed your father. What was his name? Draconis. The Malazan Empire shares that dislike. So, in sharing enemies, Lady Envy said, We are perforce allies. A reasonable surmise. Unfortunately, wrong. Regardless, I would be pleased to provide what food and drink you are able to carry, though I have nothing in the way of weapons, I'm afraid. In return, I may someday ask of you a favor. Nothing grand, of course. Something small and relatively painless. Is this acceptable? Talk felt his appetite draining away. He glanced at Tool, got no help from the undead warrior's expressionless (laughs) face. (laughs) Talk about poker face. (laughs) Yeah. Talk scowled and said, you have me at a disadvantage, Lady Envy. She smiled. Talk thought, and here I was hoping we'd get past the polite civility to something more intimate. Here you go again, Talk, thinking with the wrong brain. (laughs) Her smile broadened. Flushing, he reached for his cup and said, very well, I agree to your proposal. She said, your equanimity is a delight, Talk the Younger. He almost choked on his wine. He thought, if I wasn't a sword-kissed, one-eyed bastard, I'd be tempted to call that a flirt. Tool spoke. Lady Envy, if you seek further knowledge of this rent, you will not find it here. Talk was pleased to see the mild shock on her face as she swung to the Talani mess. She asked, Indeed? It appears I am not alone in enjoying a certain coyness. Can you explain? Anticipating the response to that, Talk the Younger grunted, then ducked as she flashed him a dark look. Tool predictively replied, Perhaps. Talk thought, Ha! I knew it! Laconic <laughs> <laughs> as ever. <laughs> An edge came into her tone as she said, Please do so, then. Tool said, I follow an ancient trail, Lady Envy. 
Morn was but one stop on that trail. It now leads northward. You would find your answers among those I seek. Lady Envy said, you wish me to accompany you. Tool said, I care not either way. Should you choose to stay here, however, I must warn you. Meddling with the rent has its risks, even for one such as you. She crossed her arms and asked, you think I lack suitable caution? Tool said, even now you have reached an impasse, and your frustration mounts. I add one more incentive, Lady Envy. Your old traveling companions are converging on the very same destination, the Panion Daman. Both Animander Rake and Caladan Brood prepare to wage war against the Daman. A grave decision. Does that not make you curious? She said, you are no simple Talani mass. Tool made no reply to that. So she has some history with Animander Rake and Caladan Brood, which makes sense given she's probably also fairly old. They were bound to cross paths at some point. Yeah, and like I stated earlier, I'm assuming she's a somewhat, if not immortal, extremely long-lived. And like I said, ascendant or not, not sure, but powerful, I'm assuming immensely due to her, again, her parentage, her elder godfather. Mm -hmm. Talk jumped in and said, he has you at a disadvantage, it seems, barely restraining his amusement. Lady Envy snapped, I find impertinence disgustingly unattractive. Whatever happened to your affable equanimity, talked the younger. He wondered at his sudden impulse to fling himself down at her feet, begging forgiveness. Shrugging the absurd notion off, he said, badly stung, I think. Her expression softened to something doe-like. The irrational desire returned. Tox scratched his scar, looked away. She said, I did not intend to sting you. Tox thought, right, and the Queen of Dreams has chicken feet. He went on, and I sincerely apologize. She faced Tool again and said, very well, we shall all of us undertake a journey. How exciting! She gestured to her segulous servants and commanded, Begin preparations at once! Tool said to Tok, I shall collect materials for your bow and arrows now. We can complete them on the way. Tok nodded, then added, I wouldn't mind watching you make them, Tool. Could be useful knowledge. Tool seemed to consider, then tilted his head and said, We found it so. They all turned at a loud grunt from where Senu lay against the wall. He had regained consciousness to find the A standing over him, the beast licking with obvious pleasure the painted <laughs> patterns on his mask. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Tool explained in his usual deadpan tone, the medium appears to be a mixture of charcoal, saliva, and human blood. <laughs> Talk muttered, now that is what I call a rude awakening. Lady Envy brushed close to him as she moved towards the doorway and cast him a glance as she passed. She said, oh, I am looking forward to this outing. The anything but casual contact slipped a nest of serpents into Tox's gut. Despite his thudding heart, he was not sure if he should be pleased or terrified. I'm leaning towards the latter. Agreed. Such an unpredictable and dangerous aura is coming off of her. Yes, she gives me the willies. <laughs> yes. It's too dangerous, man. Mm -hmm. Kind of like in an episode of MASH, when I was a kid, I don't know why the rules have always pertained. It's like, never sleep with a woman who has a tattoo of a dagger anywhere on her body. Um, <laughs> I think this kind of qualifies in that same kind of, you know, with ascendants or daughters of ascendants and you're not, you know, in the same power class as them, you need to kind of shy away from those ladies. It's a bad idea. You're getting used a, for yeah, some yeah, reason. Oh, yeah. And you may not survive the encounter. <laughs> that's, 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 a great, that's a great point. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know if you'd survive. Yeah. I'm thinking of the boys, actually. Exactly what I was thinking of. That's exactly what I'm thinking about the Ice Princess. And yeah, is that what you, that's exactly what you're thinking about, isn't it? No, there's multiple examples. Yes. And thus the chapter ends. Good chapter. Good first chapter. Yeah, great start to the book. Good gracious. For standout moments, finding out that talk is alive yes. is a pleasure. Yes. Very, very happy about this. And then him meeting up with Tool doubly so super excited it's got a buddy cop movie vibes here you know we need a great 70s tv style intro for these two not unlike american dad's wheels and the leg man <laughs> have you seen this brilliant parody the wheels and the leg man i have not oh my word it's just hilarious brilliant great stuff i enjoyed the introduction of lady envy her dags and the stegula <laughs> All right, so are we shifting focus from horses to dags in in this book and so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do agree with your statement, though. But are we are we shifting focus? I I, I think there's some. Do I, I I know there's not a lot of. I don't believe there's a lot of horse interaction in this one. But I recall the stuff with. I seem to recall stuff with these two, Gareth and Baljag. I can't remember any notable horses in this book. Yeah, I, we can't talk about it. Yeah. 
I enjoyed getting some additional background on Lady Envy from Tool. Oh, love that off the cuff Wikipedia style entry from Tool there. That's just brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it's a brilliant little, just like, just that little bit. It's like, golly, that's a lot. I need to know more. But it's like, there you go. Would you like to know more? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I do want to know more, please. <laughs> Probably the best part of the chapter for me was that unseen fight between Senu and Tool. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think of my kids or my pets or something. Go, you know, yes. like some shenanigans going on, and then they act like nothing happened. And I love that it's so fast that Senu's swords are not even cleared of the scabbard. Oh man, they're halfway out, so you know it's fast. And it's like I'm assuming it's one shot, flat of the thing, right across the forehead, whack, dude. But it hit him so hard it knocked him back about 10 paces so it's like wow that's a hell of a blow that's a pretty hard blow man goodness and then finally tools deadpan joke delivery are the talan i mass the kings of dad jokes because no. he's really killing it no they are the masters of wait for it deadpan humor <laughs> sorry is that too bad is that... i'll allow is that... it i'll allow okay. it <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great job tonight, Billy. Hey, man. Fantastic episode, dude. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Man, what a great introduction and bring it back talk and tool. Oh, so happy. So happy. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Great stuff, man. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hey, we'll see y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.